It's June 23rd, 2007. The NASCAR Busch Series is racing in a standalone event at the Milwaukee Mile in Wisconsin, while the Nextel Cup Series spends the weekend at Infineon Raceway in California. This weekend will provide a rare opportunity for the Busch Series regulars to compete with minimal interference from Cup Series drivers. But what could have been the greatest night of a young driver's career is turned into a complete farce, as Joe Gibbs' Busch Series development driver is pulled from the car mid-race to allow his Cup Series driver to finish it. But what led to this controversy? How did this so-called Bush League move come to take place? This is the story of the 2007 AT&T 250, what ultimately became one of the most controversial races in NASCAR history. I gotta tell you, I think that's a bad decision. They're doing this for the sponsor, I hear. But you know what, this kid, Eric Amarillo, has been running great. It looks like they're gonna go down a lap right now for sure. I don't like this. This whole thing is a real tough deal. He's looking. He's got to be upset. He's doing a great job out there. This guy that was a lap down, just trying to claw his way back on the lead lap, and all of a sudden here he's the man to beat. Okay, okay, maybe I'll back up and say that was a smart decision. Put Teddy back in the car. Okay, that's okay for me to say that, right? I was, yeah. get, I was getting ready to bring that whole discussion <laughs> oh, thing I, up again. I can read it in your eyeballs. No. I was just really sad for Eric Amarillo pulling pull out of that car, but Denny is flat putting it on him right now. Denny Hamlin started the day in Sonoma, California on the Infineon Raceway Road Course, practicing his next L Cup car for tomorrow's race. Got here late, jumped in the car after Alvarola qualified it on the pole and led the start of the race. Oh, yes. And it will have all been worth it for him. He got hard, baby. He got hard. We all love you. Denny Hamlin wins at the Milwaukee Mile. Good job, Denny. Eric, if you're listening, you did an awesome job, too. Eric, this is your race car, man. I appreciate everything you did. Hi, there's a lot of emotion tonight. Uh, we got hardware. It's out of all the way. Just want to thank all the uh, people from Paul for making it all happen. Um, I didn't want to do it. I mean, I, I knew he would be really upset as, as well as he was running at the time. Uh, you know, but uh, we, we got to do what we got to do. And, you know, I, I definitely wasn't my choice, but uh, for the sure thing to come out here and get this win after such a long trip and not being able to land and uh, everything just sitting out the first 60 laps, that was amazing to come back and win this thing. The concept of bushwhacking alone is controversial in the NASCAR community to this day. Many argue that Cup Series drivers competing in what is now the Xfinity Series take spotlight away from the series regulars, making it harder for them to make a name for themselves, and in some cases, taking rides away from prospects altogether. Others say that bushwhacking actually helps young Xfinity Series drivers because if they want to prove that they belong among the best drivers in the sport, they might as well have a chance to beat the best drivers in the sport. No matter where you stand on the issue, there's no denying that bushwhacking had gotten out of control around 2007. The Samstown 300 at Las Vegas in March saw 26 cup regulars in the field of 43. You have to go all the way down to Shane Huffman in ninth place before you find the first Bush Series regular in the race report. Now let's flash forward to June of that season. The Bush Series is in Milwaukee, a track the Cup Series doesn't visit on their tour. It's a standalone event. And it's not like the Cup guys are just down the road this weekend either. They're all the way out in Sonoma, California, over 2,100 miles from Milwaukee. Because of a long distance, only three drivers will travel back and forth to compete in both races. Carl Edwards, who's already running away with the Bush Series championship, his Roush Family Racing teammate David Reagan, a Cup rookie still looking to gain all the experience he can, and Denny Hamlin, a second-year Cup driver for Joe Gibbs Racing. Hamlin hasn't run any standalone Bush events yet this season, but because Gibbs' sponsor, Rockwall Automation, is headquartered in Wisconsin, Gibbs wants his Cup star in this Bush race. Another storyline entering the race weekend was the fact that Wisconsin-born drivers had won each of the two previous series races at this track. And there's one driver in particular looking to continue that trend. Richard Childress Racing's Scott Wimmer. Wimmer drives RCR's 29 car part-time, splitting the season with their cup driver Jeff Burton. Burton's already won multiple races this season, and while Wimmer's had some strong runs, he's still looking for that first victory with his new team. And he's optimistic it can come at his home track of Milwaukee. This is your home track. So what would a win here, where would that rank on your level, on your list of accomplishments in, in this series? Well, I think it'd probably be the biggest win of my career. I've been coming here since I was a little kid and watched my uncle win races here, watched Dick Trickle win races. So I'm, uh, I'm really excited about it. I got a lot of friends, a lot of family here. And right now we're looking for the helicopter, see if we're going to start on the front row or in second row. But Holiday and Chevrolet is really good tonight. Wimmer paces both practice sessions, but he's beaten to the pole by Gibbs' development driver, Eric Almarola. But wait, isn't Hamlin racing this weekend? 
Well, yes, but he's still on his way from Sonoma where he's been getting his cup car ready for the race there tomorrow. Edwards and Reagan are in the same boat, so Travis Quapel and Eric Darnell are practicing their respective cars. Edwards barely makes it back to the track in time to qualify his own car, saying had he been one minute later than he was, he wouldn't have made it back in time to qualify. Uh, Carl, first of all, we, we showed the video of you running over and getting your car out. Any travel difficulties other than the sprint getting over here? <laughs> A little bit of travel difficulties. I had to wait on David Reagan for about five minutes, uh, but that ended up costing him. He didn't make his lap. He's sitting behind you. I'm giving him a hard time, but just um, we stopped for fuel once. We didn't get enough fuel on the plane, so we had to stop again. That's what got us. But uh, it's not so hard to run that far. It's just hard when a bunch of people are staring at you. You know, kind of freaks you out a little bit. I wasn't breathing right, and uh, it just wore me out pretty bad. Hamlin, however, is still traveling of a track, so Almirola gets him a 20 car and puts it on pole. The ironic thing is that the exact same thing had happened at this race the year before. How would you like to be Eric Almirola here? For the second year in a row, you put your team's car in pole position only to give it up to the cup driver for the race because of sponsorship wishes. Man, the sport absolutely stinks sometimes. So now it's time for the race. Except there's one problem. Denny Hamlin's still not here. His helicopter doesn't have a place to land. The infield helicopter pad is blocked, which means Hamlin has to land outside the track, further delaying his arrival. So what happens? Well, the team has no choice but to let Almirola get in the car and start the event. Well, Jamie, it's official. Eric Almirola is starting this race in the number 20 car. The team quickly changed those seat inserts, and Almirola rolled off pit road. Now, Denny Hamlin is currently still on his way to the track. According to the team, he's getting a police escort. I asked crew chief Dave Rogers if the team would think about making a driver change mid-race. He said as long as Eric feels comfortable in that car, they'll leave him in it. He won the pole. They'll let him win the race. You're Dallas lying. Cowboy. You're, I think, you just listen, lied to America. Listen, You're listen. lying. Amarola will hold strong, maintaining the lead until Edwards takes it from him shortly after a lap 43 restart. At this point, Hamlin's managed to make it inside the track, but he figures it's all for nothing as the team will probably just let Amarola run the entire race. He's so confident he won't be needed, he's actually recruited by Stephen Wallace's team as a potential replacement driver since Wallace is feeling unwell. Dave, got some more news from the 66 pit? Yeah, but it may not be what you're expecting, Alan. After we came down here to check on the tire situation, we ran into Denny Hamlin. Denny, what are you doing here in the 66 pit? Um, you know, I got a message that uh, Stephen wasn't feeling good, so, um, you know, I think they were asking about Eric, so, um, you know, if they need a driver, I'm, I'm here looking for one. How disappointed not to get in the 20 when you finally got here, Denny? Um, well, it's disappointing that we were just hovering on the racetrack while the driver intros are going on, and, and either the track or NASCAR wouldn't let us land, you know, it's, that's, um, I, we, there's a lot of people that spend a lot of time and money trying to get me here, but you know, this is all about supporting Rockwell Automation. They've been part of this Bush Series program with Joe Gibbs for three to four years, and um, I think Eric would do just a good job for him. I think it, it, taking him out of the car right now would be pretty disrespectful. Then, on lap 57, Truck Series regular Ron Hornaday Jr., making a rare Bush Series appearance, crashes out of the race, causing another yellow. It's at this point that Joe Gibbs Racing makes one of the most controversial decisions in series history. They're going to use the caution as an opportunity to put Hamlin in the 20 car. Just a second ago, under this caution, Denny Hamlin's car brought down pit road by Eric Almirola, giving up third place to make the driver change. I gotta tell you, I think that's a bad decision. They're doing this for the sponsor, I hear. But you know what, this kid, Eric Almirola, has been running great. It looks like they're gonna go down a lap right now for sure. I don't like this. This whole thing is a real tough deal. He's looking. He's got to be upset. He's doing a great job out there. It seems like there was some kind of miscommunication too, because we heard him talking about earlier they were going to leave Eric Armarola in the car, but uh, somebody must have made the decision higher up, maybe to take him out of the car. Yeah, but it's, it, that is really crazy. I mean, you got a guy running the top three, doing a great job, and you pull him out of the car just because you're trying to. I don't know what the team is well, in yeah. a hole here at a disadvantage. Yeah, they've killed the team now by doing this. And our, our reporters will find out more specifically from, from uh, the team down there about why this decision was made once they finish getting Denny in. But in the meantime, they're having all kinds of problems getting Denny Hamlin into that race car. They've already lost one lap and may lose another one here. While they sit there, they couldn't get the insert out that Almirola used and then the insert into the seat that Denny uses. And, you know, it, it's not an easy thing to buckle a driver into really these so cars. It's so long now to get these guys trapped in with all the safety equipment and all the headrests. And you got to have all the uh, Hans device hooked up and steering wheel clipped on. There's a lot of work that it takes to get these guys ready to go. It's not like just jumping out of the car like they did 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, just throw the belts off and jump in and out. Well, it looks like he's going to make it. Only lose one lap, I think. The pace car is coming off of four. You see him firing up right now. Now, look, we know one thing. He's got a fast car. 
he can get this lap back, that's for sure. And can he win the race? Yeah. Was it the right decision to do it? I don't think so. I don't well, care he's if he's got he his work cut out for him. Yep, that's right. Gibbs took their young prospect, who had qualified the car on pole, who led the first 43 laps, who was running third at the time, and pulled him from the car so that he could be replaced with a second-year cup regular. The driver change causes the team to drop from third to 34th in the running order, and the 20 car, now driven by Hamlin, goes a lap down. Let me repeat that again. The Gibbs team willingly sacrificed an entire lap and 31 positions on track to put Denny Hamlin in a car he hadn't practiced or qualified in. Because apparently that made more sense than just leaving Amarola in P3. Hamlin will spend much of the middle portion of the race a lap down until around 100 laps to go when a caution is put out for debris. Hamlin finally receives the free pass as the first car one lap down and joins the tail end of the lead lap cars. Some of these guys need to work on their car. Oh, sorry. Just thinking about this. Guess who gets the free pass? Oh, I think Carl's been worried about this, this 20 car. Well, it's taken him 145 laps to get there, but he's got there. Now, he's got the lucky dog. He's going to go all the way around, get to the back. That's going to put him about uh, 16th. Yep. Now he's got to drive through 16 cars now. As Hamlin cuts his way through the field, Edwards is struck with misfortune as he suffers a flat tire, taking the dominant car of the night out of contention. Mike Wallace had assumed the lead for a few laps until lap 173, when he's passed by none other than James Dennis Hamlin. That's for the race lead, 20 in the 7. What a job he's done to get his car up here. Takes the lead for Mike Wallace on the high side. Well, except the leaderboard doesn't say that. The leaderboard still says Eric Almirola. NASCAR rules state that in the case of a mid-race driver change, the driver who starts the race receives credit for the finish. This means that if Hamlin can hold on to the lead, Almirola will score his first career Bush Series victory, having already left the track in disgust after being pulled from his car, his pole qualifying car he led 43 laps with, sorry to keep bringing it up, mid-race to give way to a Cup Series driver. But it's not going to be a cakewalk for Hamlin. Scott Wimmer, who remember, is trying to score his first win of the year at his home track, and Jason Leffler, who qualified second behind Almirola and just ahead of Wimmer, are both hungry and both have fast cars. A late caution brings everyone onto pit road, and Wimmer's pit crew gets him the lead. He'll hold it until another caution forces another restart. Hamlin takes both Wimmer and Leffler three wide to make a pass for the lead with 13 to go. Wimmer gets one last chance at hometown glory on a final restart, but Hamlin holds him off the final four laps to take, well, Eric Almirola's first ever Bush Series victory. Denny Hamlin started the day in Sonoma, California on the Infinium Raceway Road Course, practicing his next L Cup car for tomorrow's race. Got here late, jumped in the car after Almirola qualified it on the pole and led the start of the race. Oh, yes! And it will have all been worth it for him. You got heart, baby. You got heart. We all love you. Denny Hamlin wins at the Milwaukee Mile. Good job, Denny. Eric, if you're listening, you did an awesome job, too. Eric, this is your race car, man. I appreciate everything you did. Guys, there's a lot of emotion tonight. Uh, we got hardware. We set up all over the race. Just want to thank all the uh, people from Marvel for making it all happen. Well, in the record books, it's going to say Eric Almirola won the AT&T 250 in Milwaukee tonight. That's some kind words from the crew, though, to a Denny head with, towards Eric. I mean, he brought Eric back in to make him feel part of this win, part of the team. The crew That's chief, awesome. Crew chief also coaching Denny Hamlin and making him, helping him dig deep. Normally, a driver's first career win is a celebration like none other. But in this case, the first-time winner in question isn't even at the racetrack anymore. It's more awkward than anything. Hamlin was quoted as not even wanting to get in the car, saying he knew it would upset Almirola. Dave Rogers said you were reluctant to get behind the wheel and replace Eric. Um, I didn't want to do it. I mean, I, I knew he would be really upset as, as well as he was running at the time. But he's not the only one who was upset by the move. ESPN's Terry Blunt, in a play on baseball terminology, calls it a Bush League move saying Almirola had every right to be furious and lamenting the fact that cup dominance in the lower levels had gotten to the point where they were replacing Bush Series drivers after the race had already started. Even those who weren't openly critical of the move were left more dumbfounded than anything. Runner-up Wimmer said he was surprised Gibbs made the switch given how strong Almirola had been running towards the start of the race. So why was the change made? 
Did the team simply think the slightly more experienced Hamlin would have given them a chance at a better finish? Well, maybe. J.D. Gibbs acknowledged Amarola was upset and said he'd be too if he were in his shoes. But he also stated, quote, I told those guys as a group, if you think Denny can get in the car and win the race, let's go. Let's do that. If you don't think he can do that, let Eric run it out. Our guys kind of thought about it as a group and said, okay, we think Denny can run well and we're fast enough to win the race. That was a huge disappointment, of course, to Eric. All right, well, sure. Hamlin's the reigning cup rookie of the year. He's got slightly more experience than Almirola, but was it really worth pulling him from the car after he qualified on pole, led over 40 laps, and maintained a spot in the top three? Well, there's more to the story. As I mentioned at the start, this is the home track and home race for Rockwell Automation, Gibbs' sponsor of a 20 car. And the general consensus between both Almirola and Gibbs' other driver, Brad Coleman, is that this was their most important race of the year, and they wanted their cup star behind the wheel, even if it meant making a driver change mid-race. Just goes to show how much of a say sponsors have in this sport sometimes. J.D. Gibbs said after the race, thank goodness Hamlin won, it would have looked bad if he didn't. But the truth is, it looked bad regardless. For Almirola, he'll receive the winner's check and credit him a stat book, but he won't consider it his first career win, saying that'll come after he crosses the finish line first on track for himself. At the end of the year, he'll be released from his development contract with Gibbs and begin running a partial cup schedule for DEI. He'll bounce around a lot in the coming years, running trucks with Billy Ballou in 2010 and nearly winning the championship, back to the renamed Nationwide Series in 2011 for Dale Jr.'s team, and then back to Cup in Richard Petty's famous number 43 car. Ironically, Amarola will get his first cup win before he gets his first real Xfinity Series win. A well-timed thunderstorm at the July Daytona race in 2014 gives Almirola the victory, 30 years to the day of car owner Richard Petty's 200th win. He'll even get that Xfinity win at Daytona two years later. Today, he's driving for Stuart Haas Racing and equipment capable of winning on any given race weekend. So fortunately, despite this whole controversy with Gibbs, things turned out alright for Almirola after all. And that's the story of what might be the most controversial instance of bushwhacking in NASCAR history. We still see cup drivers in the Xfinity Series today, but it's far less frequent. And thanks to limitations on how many races cup drivers can run per year, the practice is almost non-existent at standalone Xfinity races, meaning we'll never see another race quite like the 2007-18 T250 ever again. Until next time, I'm Ben Schneider. Thanks for watching. If you want to hear more about my thoughts on bushwhacking in general, go to the 17 minute 25 second mark of this episode of my podcast.